It's been a few months ago. Uh, sitting in the office reading. And I come across a word that I've read this many times. If you will, take your Bibles and turn to Joshua chapter 24. You all know this verse. We've, we quote this verse. And yet, I never saw this word. Joshua chapter 24, starting in verse 14. We quote verse 15 all the time, right? We get plaques on it. We get things in our house that have these, these words. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, right? We know that verse. We know that. And we, we preach that and we teach that. And I was reading down through and I read in verse 14 where it says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land we dwell, ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in word of prayer as we begin. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight, Lord, and we thank you for the opportunity to be here. We thank you for your word that you've given to us. And Lord, we just thank you that your spirit drew us, Lord, that you, you called us and you drew us. And you, you've never left us, but you've, and you've never forsaken us. Lord, that you help us, you guide and lead us through our lives. You keep your hand upon us, Lord. And we thank you for that and thank you for the way that you led us here tonight, even giving us a desire to be in your services, Lord. And we just ask that you'd help us to... Take the thoughts of this world out of our minds and out of our hearts just for a little bit, Lord, and help us to serve you and truly serve you in spirit and in truth tonight, Lord. Give us hearing ears, and Lord, and just seeing eyes, Lord, and help us to have that desire that when the services are over, Lord, that we not just close our Bibles and leave, but that we have a desire to seek those things out, Lord, to prove them true in our own hearts, Lord, to, to just look at them closely, Lord, and just put them in our hearts and our minds in such a way that it changes us tonight, Lord. Lord, we just ask that anybody here that's lost, Lord, you know who they are, that you would just convict them of their lost condition, Lord, and show them, Lord, bring them to their repentance, Lord, and help them to be saved. Save them tonight, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for all you've done, Lord, be it the prayer request has been mentioned. In Jesus' name, pray and ask these things. Amen. So, in this verse 14, I was reading here, and I come across the word sincerity. And it blew me away. I said, wait a minute. I have heard people say all the time, as long as you're sincere, and we've said that's wrong. But yet, here's the word in the Bible that we are to serve Him in sincerity and in truth. So, I learned a long time ago, for me, it may not be the way for you, but for me, when I, when I come across a word that I don't know what it means, I don't know how it's used, I look it up every place it's used in the Bible. I find those verses... I look it up because sometimes that same word can be used and translated a different word. So I look up, I don't look up sincerity, I go look up the Hebrew word and see where it's mentioned in the Bible. Look it up and find out all the ways it's used. And it gives me a better idea of what it means because I was wondering what is it talking about? Because we tell people you, it doesn't matter how sincere you are. But yet, here's the word. In the Bible. Now, is, the, is it here by mistake? Is it a clerical error? Do we believe it? Yeah, and you've heard me say, you've heard Dad say, and other people say that, are you going to believe God's word or not? Are you going to believe it? I don't. I'm going to say, I was going to say that wrong. I do believe that every word in his word is there on purpose. Every, every letter I believe the Lord can handle it so much that every letter is where it's supposed to be. So when I come across a word that I don't know what to do with, it's not me that's not understanding. I mean, it's not me that's right. It's me that's wrong. So I looked up the word sincerity. I looked up what it means and how it's used. It's used 91 times in the Bible. Not the word sincerity, the Hebrew word sincerity is used, what it's translated as, is used 91 times. 44 times it's without blemish, is how it's translated. 18 times it's perfect. 8 times it's upright. 
Six times it means without spot. Four times is uprightly. Four times is whole. Two times is sincerity. Sincerely, one time is complete. When you look at the definition of this, it means complete, whole, entire, and sound. That's not what the world means by sincere. That's not. The world wants to take this and say, well, as long as you're sincere, as long as you truly believe what you're saying. But what I found, and what I preached this message at home. I'm not going to preach the whole thing here because it took me around 14 to 15 weeks to preach this. Because it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. When I began to look and to see what how we're to serve the Lord, how we're to follow Him. It's not just, we know it's not just coming to church, right? We know it's not just coming to church and sitting in the pews. That's not serving the Lord. It's it's inside us where we serve Him. It's in our heart where we worship Him. And that's what He's talking about. And there's verses all over the Bible that bring you to this, because you look at this, and He tells them to serve the Lord in sincerity and in truth. But turn, if you will, and I think I can find this pretty quick. Judges chapter 2 and verse 10. Judges chapter 2 and verse 10. This is after Joshua has died. Joshua, the son of Nun, in verse 8, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. Verse 9 says, And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in um, Timetrius, in the Mount of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill of Gaash. And verse 10, look, listen to what verse 10 says. And also, all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. So the generation that knew Joseph, they all died. It says, And there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord nor yet the works that he had done for Israel. You're talking two to three generations later didn't know. Why? Why didn't they know? And that just... I, I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know... Because I'm sitting here and I'm reading that and I didn't know that verse was in there. I, I, it blew my mind. And as I looked at that, I I began to think about my kids. I began to go back. I got out the 6,000-year earth, and I looked at the outline, the the years when when, um, Moses and Joshua, and I looked at those years and how many generations, and it was quick. It was really quick. And then I began to think about my grandma and grandpa Mac, how that's one generation. My mom is another generation. I'm another generation. And then I thought about my kids is another generation. And now KJ's kids is another five generations. And you're talking about two or three yeah. that did not know. What happened? What happened to the people of Israel? That they went away from the Lord. That they didn't teach their kids. That their kids didn't know. You know, Whenever Trish and I were dating, we talked about things and she wanted to have a lot of kids. I didn't want any kids. I didn't want them. And she said, well, why don't you want kids? Kids are great. I said, no, they're not. They're little brats and they're pains. And I worked at a restaurant. I worked on restaurants my whole life. And all I saw coming in that restaurant was naughty nose bratty kids. I didn't listen and screamed and hollered. And, and what she said was, you don't get upset with the kids, you smack the parents. It's not the kids' fault. The kids weren't taught. It's the parents' fault that the kids scream and holler and don't listen. So I look at this and I think about that. Do we, the generation that didn't know the Lord, whose fault is it they don't know the Lord? Is it theirs? Or is it the parents' fault for not teaching them? I know there's a, there's a part of that where the teacher is teaching and the student has a responsibility to learn, right? To have that. But how do we serve the Lord? Do we know how to serve the Lord? 
what I found in this, and I don't know if I should admit this or not, sometimes I was serving the Lord half-heartedly and not even knowing I was doing that. Because we are to serve Him in sincerity and in truth. But it's not my truth. You see that? He says they're to serve the Lord in sincerity and in truth. In Joshua 24, 14. What is truth? You can't go by what this world says is truth. This world thinks truth, it only matters, it, 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 it moves. But truth doesn't move. Truth is grounded, truth is firm, truth is solid. There's only one truth. If you go out there on 70 right now, right in front of this building, and you drive down 70, and your compass tells you that you're heading north, are you going to be going north? What if you truly believe? What if you sincerely believe you're heading north? I mean, you believed it. Does it change the truth of what, which direction you're going? No, it doesn't. So what does he mean here in sincerity and in truth? He doesn't mean the truth that you think. What I've discovered, and I'm giving you a whole bunch here, because I can't give you all 14 weeks in one hour. I can't do it. But what I discovered is something. Do you know it doesn't matter what I believe? It doesn't matter what you believe. If you're stuck, this is what I believe. Be careful. That's a slippery slope. Because now you're trusting in what you believe. So well, what, what does matter? If it doesn't matter what I believe, what matters is what God's Word says. If we are not dependent on what God's Word says, if we are so stuck on this is what I've always believed, this is what I've always stood on, this is what, I've, this is what my parents believed, look, none of that matters. None of that matters. If that's where we're holding our, that's where our trust and our faith is, then we're not serving the Lord in sincerity and in truth. Because it's our truth, not His truth. We have to have His truth. When you look up all these places, sincerity is mentioned. We're going to look up a few of them, not many. Um, I'm going to try and get through point one. But just to tell you, point one took me three weeks to get through. So we're not, probably not going to get through all of point one. But it was just looking up the different places and sincerity is mentioned. To, so that it wasn't me. I don't want it to be me saying what sincerity means. I don't want that. Because that doesn't help you at all. I want you to see what God's word says sincerity is. How that he says we ought to be serving him. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. We are going to look at some places where that the word sincerity is used. 1 Peter chapter 1, chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, Wherefore laying aside all malice and all guile and all hypocrisies and envies and evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. We are, here again, we're, we are to serve the Lord and we are to have a desire for the sincere milk, the pure milk. Remember that word, I was looking up words that meant pure, that meant spotless, that meant complete. That's what the definition was for sincerity. How we're to serve the Lord. And this word sincere is that definition. It means pure. Righteous. We are to have a desire for the sincere milk of the word. Whose word? It's not my word. It's not your word. It's not what you think the word says. But it's what God's word says. It's what it is. We know that there is no private interpretation, right? We know that. So it's not what we think. Some of these, some of these are kind of difficult sometimes. Because I don't want to be told I'm wrong. I don't want to. 
I want to be told I'm right. You know, it's humbling when you realize that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I believe. I can't lean on that. What I have to lean on and what I always have to go by is what God's Word says. You know, and I don't, I don't think it was ever a mistake. Well, I don't think so, no. When I was a plumber, I had to go buy a code book, right? And then, when I couldn't plumb anymore, I became a plumbing inspector, which what did I go by? Plumbing code book. And when I told someone, you, you can't do that, you know what they would always ask me? What's the code? Show me the code. You know what people ask me now in the church when I say, well, I don't know if that's right. It's a verse. There's no difference. They want to know from the code book. I have to know the code book. Sometimes I would go inspect plumbers' jobs. Sometimes there was, there was a couple plumbers that I didn't like inspecting their stuff because they knew that code book front and right and they knew how to twist it. And they, they were a pain. Kind of reminded me of some different religions. They know what God's word says, but they twist it just enough. I had the, when Pete Larson's dad passed away, his dad was Catholic. Um, so that's why Pete's having a hard time with this. Um, went to the visitation, and, you know, Pete's a member of the church. He's one of my members. So he told the church, he said, I don't expect y'all to come to the funeral. Well, I'm going to the funeral. He's one of mine. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm going. I've never been to a Catholic funeral before. It was different. It was very different. But what amazed me is the verses they read. Tell you, they read some of those verses and I was shocked. They were reading the truth. But they were twisting it. Look, it's not their truth either. We, we're Baptists, right? We're independent Baptists. But don't get caught up in that. What we are is followers of God's word. We should be that more than we are anything else. If we're going to get hung up and say, well, I'm Baptist. I'm a Baptist. What are you following? Are you following Baptist tradition? Or are you following God's word? Because nowadays, independent Baptists around this area, you know what they're starting to be now? Non-denominational. What non-denominational used to be, they're calling them independent now. So now when you say you're an independent Baptist, oh, I know what that is. <laughs> you may not know what that is. There's some in Troy that call themselves independent Baptists, but they're non-denominational. The name changes. I'm thankful God's word does not change. We need to have a desire. Look, we want to serve him in sincerity and in truth. Look, you'll see in these verses, and we're not going to get very far, I can tell you. But it doesn't come on the outside. It's got to start on the inside. You notice the word here in verse 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. Do you have a desire to know more about the Lord? Do you have a desire to be in His Word? Do you, do you get at the end of your day and one of the things you check off in your mind that you've read? Or do you look past that? Do you read God's Word every day? One of the things I, I tell, and I've said this here, it's, it's been drawn into me it's been told to me quite a few times and I'm telling to other people now. Look, if you want to serve the Lord, if you want to do, if you want to be what He wants you to be, you can't do that without being in a word. You can't. You can't serve Him. If you have difficulties in your lives and you have problems going through that you're going through and you pray and ask Him for help, it cannot be a one-sided conversation if you need help. And the only way to have a two-sided conversation with God is to open up the Bible and read it. You've got to be in His Word. 
Do you have a desire to hear from Him? Are you sitting here in the pew? You could be sitting here looking up at me, nodding your head, agreeing with everything I'm saying, and yet want to be someplace else. Then you're not serving the Lord in sincerity and in truth. You're not. You're a hypocrite. Plain and simple. Because you're making it look like you're here serving the Lord when you really would rather be someplace else. You think God don't see that? He sees it. He sees everything we do. Everywhere we go. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 8. He says, Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. Now listen. But with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. We are to serve the Lord. We're to follow Him. We're to give ourselves to Him, not with what we have, but with what He's given us. Look, there's nothing in us that's good. There's not. Would you be here if it wasn't for the hand of God on you? Would you? Some of y'all are answering no. Some of y'all are just sitting there staring at me. The answer is no. But in all honesty, we don't like that answer, do we? We don't. What I want to say is yes, I would be here. I want to say... Being completely honest, I want to say I was in church when I was lost. I was. I went to every service. Every one of them. Just don't ask me why I went. You know why I went? You know why I went. Him and Mom. It's the only reason why I was here. They didn't ask me if I wanted to. Get in the car. It's time for church. Same thing we do to our kids. When they're younger, when Derek was younger, he, is, this, is this a school day? He gets up and wants to know, is this a school day? No, it's not a school day. All right. Then we can play. He gets up and says, is this a church day? Yeah, it's a church day. Oh. And he's going to be in church all day. You know, he's figuring that out. The other kids know. They get up and they get ready. Why? They don't ask us, are we going to church today? No, we're going. We, none of us would be here. None of us. Am I asking you about your salvation? No. You know, you could be saved and not have a desire to be in church. You could be. And I can prove that biblically. You can look at the life a lot. He was saved. He had no desire to serve the Lord. He didn't. He, he looked out and followed the, what his eyes saw. That's what he did. And he taught his children that same thing. For years he taught them that. 20 years. What are you going to teach your kids? I look out there, I know some of y'all don't have kids in the home anymore, right? But now you've got grandkids. Some of you have great grandkids. Yes, what are you teaching them? Because it's not just about what you do. It's what's in your heart. It's how you react to things. That's what's in your heart. We need to serve the Lord in sincerity and in truth. And here he tells us we don't serve him with anything that we have. We don't serve him with the old leaven. Neither the leaven of malice and wickedness that we have in us, but with unleavened bread of sincerity and in truth. It is really neat. When you find about serving the Lord with sincerity, you know what I found is pretty much always there? Truth. It's there. Because we, it's not with us. It's with Him. It's His truth. What He says we ought to be doing. How He says we ought to be living. 
What he says we ought to be, what ought to be in our hearts and in our minds is with him, not with me. My heart? What does the Bible say about our heart? Yeah. Desperately wicked, who can know it? Whose heart's he talking about? He's talking about mine. I can't follow my heart. But the world wants to tell us, follow your heart. You have a right to be happy. Have you ever studied that word blessed? You ever, you ever really studied that word blessed? I found something the other day that just amazed me. The word blessed, it, it talks about happy. We know that, right? We know that. And, but you follow that word blessed out. And as you know, in Psalms 127, you all know that Psalms? talks about children are in heritage, right? You know, it says happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. Did you know that that word happy is the same word as blessed? It's the same word. It's just translated happy instead of blessed. Same word. And you look at that and you think about that, that the world says we have a right to be happy. But God says, you want to be happy, you follow me. You know, I have a quiver full of children. You know, if you have one child, you have a quiver full. If that's all you have, you have a quiver full. A quiver full is not a number, it's what the Lord gave you. You have two, you have a quiver full. Do you know, sorry kids, but sometimes they're a headache. Sometimes, most of the time, they're fabulous. They're work. You know, you study out in, in Israel, when, it, when, in, when they talk about the olive tree, that the olive tree they have there, what they, how long it took before that olive tree would bear fruit. Do you know how long it would take before the olive tree would bear fruit? 15 to 16 years before it would bear fruit. You know what they'd have to do every, all, they'd have to cultivate that and tend it and take care of that and protect that tree. Looking forward for 15 to 16 years before they would draw a, a real harvest off that tree. Work. What do you think kids are? Kids are work. They're work. They take work and they're difficult, they're hard. But they're a blessing. They're fabulous. I tell you, I love having kids. I do. When I figured out that I liked having kids, I told Trish, I don't care, I'll buy a bus. I don't care how many we have. I don't care. I enjoyed having them around. I love having them. <coughs> so our house is not quiet. By no means is it quiet. I don't want it quiet. I want them there. And you say, well, you're getting off point. No. You want to be happy? Truly serve the Lord. And I'm using the kids to show you that it takes work. It takes determination. One of the hardest things to raise in a kid is, raising a child is what? What's the hardest thing about raising a child? Consistency. Consistency. Doing, doing, the same thing, doing. You do that again, I'm going to spank you. And they do it again, what do you do? You've got no choice. What comes out of your mouth, you better do. If you don't do, what happens? The kid knows. They don't mean it. I can go ahead and do it. Don't matter. What is that teaching a kid when you're consistent? Rules matter. Because when God says, if you do that, I'm going to get you. And what does a kid think if the parent don't get him? Authority don't really mean it. You're not helping your child by not being consistent. You're hurting them. What is the hardest thing with serving the Lord? It's one of the hardest things with serving the Lord. I don't know about you, but for me, being consistent, continuing day in, day out. Do you ever get tired? You ever get just sick of the battle in your head? You ever just want to just throw your hands up and give up and walk away? You ever just 
get frustrated? Come on, guys. We all do, don't we? We all do. Every one of us do. But we can't. How do we keep going? Because we need to be grounded in His truth. Not my truth. My truth wavers. My truth changes. That's why I can't depend on my truth. I have to depend on His truth. That's where I look to. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. of our conscience that in simplicity and godly sincerity not with fleshly wisdom but with the grace of God we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you Lord. what is he saying you can read further you need to read further start off in the first part of the chapter and read this but he says here for our rejoicing is this do you want to rejoice then your testimony your life what people see in your life of our conscience that in simplicity what does simplicity mean? we look at simplicity and I read that and I made the mistake for a long time reading this verse and thinking that it means simple that's what we think it means and we look at it, simplicity that, that's very simplicity I don't know if that's a word, if we use that word like that or not but it, it's simple but what that word means, when you look it up, it means not self-seeking, openness of heart. That's what that word means. How are we to serve the Lord? Our conscience and openness of heart, letting Him mold and make us what He wants us to be. That's what the, He says He wants Israel to be, like the potter. Like, like the pot, the clay in the potter's hand, right? The Lord wants you to be the clay in His hand. Be willing to be that. Made us for what He has for us. We serve Him without seeking our own will. Well, says that in simplicity and godly sincerity, I love that, godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom. He makes it plain, very plain. This world says as long as you're sincere, as long as you truly believe what you believe, you'll be okay. Remember Interstate 70, heading north? Doesn't matter how sincere you are, you ain't heading north. If you head north, you're going to hit a ditch pretty quick. Right? You're going to be going east or west. Doesn't matter what you believe. Doesn't change the truth. Do you want to believe what you want to believe or do you want to believe God's word? Which do you want to believe? If you haven't decided that, you need to decide which one you're going to believe. That's what Joshua was telling the people back there in Joshua 24. Choose you this day whom you will serve. If you read on past there, where he said, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What did the people of Israel say? We will serve the Lord. What did Joshua say? You can't. You can't just say you're going to do it. You've got to do it. If you just say you're going to do it, there's going to be consequences. You've got to do it. You can't just say the words. There has to, has to be work involved in this. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard. But they said, no, we will serve the Lord. We, we will. We want to. And then two generations later, two, two or three, they didn't know. I think a lot of times we want the, we want the rewards without the work. They don't come that way. It's not about 
It's not serving the Lord. Serving the Lord is not easy. Look. I've learned serving the Lord does not mean I'm going to have an easy life. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that everything is going to be hunky-dory. What it more likely means, I'm sorry, but you're going to have trouble. You're going to have trials. You're going to have difficulties. You're going to have a battle for the rest of your life. You are. It's never going to stop. I thought... Talked to when Grandpa moved up here. Grandpa Mac moved up here. Um, I was talking to him one day. We'd taken supper up to him and and uh, sitting there. And he, I said something about. I tell you, I thought that when you get older, some of this stuff would get easier. And he just chuckled. He said, "Son, I got news for you. It don't get easier. It gets harder because the more you know." the more ways you can sin. Well, that ain't very comforting. I told him I didn't want to know that. I didn't want to. But he's right. He's right. The older we get, and it's not just the more ways you know, it's the more tired you get. You get tired. But look, we got to keep going. Why? Why? I cannot, I still to this day cannot get out of my mind. Two or three generations later, they didn't know. When I look at that, I'm, I'm talking my grandkids. My great grandkids. Will they know? It depends on what I'm doing now today. That's what it depends on. Am I going to be teaching my kids, making sure they're serving the Lord, making sure they're doing right? Am I going to be doing that? Am I serving the Lord in front of them? Am I teaching them that it's not just actions? It's what's in the heart? It's good to be here in church. But if you're going to come to church and daydream, what good are you doing? You're not. We don't serve the Lord. He tells us here, and our rejoicing is this. The testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity, that's with not self-seeking openness of heart, and godly sincerity, not our sincerity, but being truthful, pure sincerity in godliness. Not with fleshly wisdom, not with what I have in my brain, my mind, but what's in His Word. But by the grace of God. Look at that. He gives us what we need to serve Him. We have everything we need to serve Him. But by the grace of God, we can serve Him. We can be what we ought to be. When we stand before the Lord, did you know I found out we'll have no excuse? None. No excuse whatsoever to do everything He told us to do. That's a little bit scary. It is a little bit scary to me. Well... I kind of lied about that. That's a whole lot scary. That scares me. To stand before the Lord and Him say, why? And there's nothing I can offer. Because He says, I've given you everything you need. Everything. By, by the grace of God, He says, we have had our conversation in the world, our life in the world. And more abundantly to you, Word. Look, our conversation, our life is in this world. But we are not to be of this world. We're to be in this world. We're to be a witness to this world. We're to be a light in this world, right? We're we're, we're the salt of this world. How are you living? This this whole series, I titled, Whom Have You Chosen? Who have you chosen? Have you chosen to serve you? To serve the the gods around you? Or have you chosen to serve the God? Jehovah. Who have you chosen to serve? And what I discovered in this. There's checks and balances all through the Bible. In your life. 
that will show who you've chosen to serve. I mean, we say we've chosen to serve the Lord. What's the most important thing to you? What is it? Say, well, it's God's Word. Okay? Do a little test this week. Keep track and write down the things you talk about. And figure out what you talk about the most. Because what you talk about the most, that's what's most important. So what is the most important thing to you? A lot of times we just answer the right answer, right? Well, God's Word, that's what's most important to me. But yet the only time, the only time you talk about God's Word is Sundays and Wednesdays. Don't be a hypocrite. Because that's being a hypocrite. What is more scary than that? We don't see it as people. You can hide it from us. But I guarantee you, your children see it. Your children know that church is not important. That's what they're seeing. That's what they're hearing. You can say it all day long. But when you put something else above God's word, above being here in the services, you are teaching your children to choose something else. That it's okay. That's scary. Because when you stand before the Lord, you cannot say, I didn't know. You can't. We are to serve Him in sincerity and in truth. And I'm out of time. We didn't get point one done. We didn't get halfway through point one. But did, you, you look up this word. You follow out sincerity and where it leads you. It, it's where it, I'll tell you where it took me to. It took me well, all through the Bible, all the way through it. But I ended up in Hebrews chapter 10. Have you read Hebrews chapter 10 lately? Verse by verse and studied out those verses? It is amazing what you'll find in there. I got to Hebrews chapter 10 verse 26. Y'all know that verse? We know verse 10, Hebrews 10 25, right? We know that one. Turn over there real quick. I'm about out of time. I got like three minutes left. I'll talk quick. Hebrews 10 verse 25. We know that one, right? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. We quote this verse, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching, right? We quote that verse, but I don't hear people quoting verse 26. Hebrews 10 26 says, for if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. I read that verse, and so I went to some commentaries, and I didn't know what it meant. I went to some commentaries, and I was figuring out pretty quick, they don't know what it meant. Because they were saying that it's talking about lost people. It can't. It can't be talking about lost people. So, I talked to the former pastor there at 12 Ryan, Brother Bowen. I asked him about it. I said, what do, you, what do you think about this verse? And he's like, well, I've heard it always saying it talks about lost people. Said, but it can't be. Yeah. It cannot be talking about lost people. And he said, why? Why can't it? I said, well, read it. Mm-hmm. Read what Paul says. He says, for if we, mm-hmm. we, when Paul talks about the lost people, he talks about them, the dead. Never we. He's talking about saved people. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, if we sin willfully after we've been saved, that's what he's saying. Willfully, We know it's wrong, but we do it anyway. What does he say? There's no more sacrifice for sins. What does he mean? I read that over and over. I read every commentary I could get my hand on, and none of them answered the question. I talked to Brother Bowen. I talked to some other men. I called and talked to Dad about it. They all had answers. But none that really 
satisfied. You know, no offense. But so I thought, you know what, maybe, maybe I'm doing this all wrong. I'm talking to men. Maybe I need to pray more about this. So I began to pray. And then it dawned on me. Huh, maybe I need to go back in chapter 10 and start reading verse 1. So I did that. That didn't help. Go back to chapter 9. That didn't help a whole lot either. I kept going back. Before long, I'm in chapter 1. I read that. I don't know how many times in Hebrews. I read that book of Hebrews every day for over two weeks, three weeks. Finally, I saw what he's talking about. Do you know what the book of Hebrews is about? Do you know what the main subject in Hebrews is talking about? That we have something better. That's what he's talking about. We have something better now. Look, when we're still on serve the Lord in sincerity and truth. Why? Because we have something better. The Israelites, they sacrificed, right? Every year they go up and they sacrifice. What would they sacrifice for every year? For their sins. And when he, when he held his hand on that, that, ram or goat, that lamb or goat's head and they cut the throat and it bled out, he would feel the life run out of that and he would remember not just this year's sins, but last year's sins and the sins before that, the year before that, and the year before that. Why? He was still guilty. He was still guilty for those things. You know, and I discovered something. It was amazing to me that I remember sins that I'd done. I remember the life I lived before I was saved. I was a good kid, but I was a sinner, right? I committed sin. But you know, when I think about those things, you know one thing I don't have about those is guilt. There's no guilt. Why? Why is there no guilt for what I'd done when I was lost? Why? It's been paid for. It's not like the sacrifice that the Israelites brought. Christ paid for it and erased that guilt. It's gone. It's gone. But the sin I commit after, I'm, after I've been saved, there's no more sacrifice for that sin. It's been paid for. It's been paid for. But I still suffer for that guilt because I remember. I look, and one of these days, I'm going to stand before the Lord, and I know that my sin has been paid for. I know that. But I know I'm going to stand before God. And you read on down through, and it talks about the God that we're going to stand before. We're going to stand before Him. And that's what it says in verse 27, but a certain fearful looking for the judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He's not saying that we're going to be devoured. He's saying we're going to stand before the one that will devour the adversaries. That's the one we're standing in front of. You sin willfully. You think about that. This is serious. We need to serve the Lord in truth, in sincerity. Not what the world says is in sincerity, but in what God says. Why? Our lives depend on it. Our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, our great-great-grandchildren. Look, we have got to serve the Lord. If we don't, the chances of them are slim. It's slim. You know, I, I said I just, I'd talk quick. I didn't talk quick enough. But... Lord willing, this will be a blessing to you and a help. You study that word, sincerity. Look at it. Study it out. It's a beautiful study. I would give you my notes, but they won't help you none. I'll give them to you, but they're not going to help you. You need to study your own. You need to write your own notes out and find it. So, I appreciate the time. Thank you.